Welcome to Grid 3's webinar series. The presenters for this webinar are Grid 3 GIS experts, Alina, Anela, and myself, Franklin. Grid 3 combines the expertise of partners in government, United Nations, academia, and the private sector to design adaptable and relevant geospatial solutions based on capacity and development needs of each country. Our vision is mapping a path to sustainable development for everyone, while our mission is to build spatial data solutions that make developmental goals achievable. Grid 3, which stands for Georeferenced Infrastructure and Demographic Data for Development, works with countries to generate, validate, and use geospatial data on population, settlement, infrastructure, and at boundaries. Grid 3 is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the United Kingdom's Foreign, Commonwealth, and Development Office. It is implemented by Columbia University's Center for International Health Science Information Network, CSIN, the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, WorldPOP at the University of Southampton, and the Flomanda Foundation. So this webinar series will focus on Geographic Information Systems, GIS, a key method for geospatial analysis. In this webinar, we will be talking about the importance of geographic information systems, known as GIS for humanitarian and developmental purpose, what GIS is, and how we apply it within Grid 3. We will also deep dive into the core concept of GIS, discussing workflows, data models, and data types. And finally, we'll cover one application example of GIS applications focusing on census modernization in Ghana. Geographic information systems help analyze and understand causes and consequences of humanitarian and developmental interventions. So mapping where people are, the environment they live in, the infrastructure they have access to, and the boundaries that define their communities are all essential for effective uh, decision making. GIS is important to decision making as it provides this information in the form of places, people, and probabilities through the nature, uh, 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 though the nature of this data in completeness, bias, and assumption needs to be recognized. GIS fits into grid three as one of the core tool set or skills. Effectively, it allows people to use our products to drive data-led outcomes. GIS can take different forms from using maps to identify the locations of schools in Nigeria to visualizing villages in Zambia that are in close proximity to each other and thus need to be sprayed in order to maximize the effects of indoor residual spraying to eradicate malaria. Access to accurate, easily visualized information is essential to coordinate effective intervention on the ground across multiple uh, actors. In terms of identification, we'll look at what is the name of the city, location analysis, where are the public health facilities, where are the schools, network analysis, what is the shortest walking route between two given points? And modeling scenarios, uh, what would be the effect on the river water quality if population doubled? And special analysis, are there patterns in building footprints which suggest residential, commercial or other uses? And change analysis, where have new homes been built in the past 10 years? So, there are many definitions of geographic information systems. However, 
A general definition is that a GIS is a computer-based tool for mapping and analyzing things that happen on the Earth. GIS technology integrates database functions such as querying of data and statistical analysis with the visual and geographic analysis benefit offered by maps. One of the origins of GIS lay in the emergence of databases incorporating the location of object. This could be in the form of a grid location for reference with a map or another form of position such as an address. So uh, much of the information used in such system was first entered uh, from a map either in a paper form or a computer screen. This information could then be used in the production of updatable and customized maps. So uh, much data involved uh, in the management of the environment or people that such as uh, services or services such as health, education, transport, etc., etc., has a geographic element in that it refers to objects or areas which exist on the earth and have a position. It is therefore sensible to organize such data by its position on a map. So uh, a GIS thus gives the opportunity to display and analyze such uh, data with respect to its geographic location and produce customized uh, paper maps very uh, quickly. Continuous data occurs across all geographic space, for example, depth, elevation, temperature, and salinity. Uh, the value can be measured at any given point and uh, therefore forms a, a surface of uh, data values. So discrete data describes uh, individual objects with finite dimension, which are typically mapped as points, lines, or areas. For example, you have uh, uh, health clinic location, roads, or buildings. So let's look at um, our GIS data models, which has to do with um, vector and raster. So data models are digital data formats, which model the reality uh, previously described. The GIS user can choose which model to best represent their geographic study. There are two main types of data structures for representing spatial features within the GIS uh, are vector and raster models. The vector data model was developed to model discrete geographic features, which could be almost any bounded feature. For example, point of interest location, rivers, district boundaries, etc., etc. The raster data was employed in GIS to model continuous geographic features such as population count, uh, elevation, temperature, vaccination coverage, and so on and so forth. Thus, the, um, the data models are discussed in the next few slides with examples. In a, in a vector system, the locations, courses, or boundaries of features are stored as a series of coordinate pairs which are connected to describe the map object. Each object is defined by a series of coordinates which describe the location and shape of the object. A point on the map will be represented by a single pair of coordinates and a line or polygon would be represented by a series of coordinate pairs linked together to form the shape. So polygon starts and ends at the same location to close the polygon. Attribute information is stored separately from this special information and joined or linked through a unique IDs or through unique feature IDs. So attributes are values or characteristics of an object that may be or that may or may not be unrelated to its position. For example, you have soil types or elevation stored data uh, linked to that location. So let's look at uh, the choice of geometric type, which could be either points, polyline, or polygon. So if we talk about points, uh, these are single markers indicating the location of a particular object or features. They differ from region in that the size and shape of the marker does not represent the size and shape of the object on the ground. They are only meant to locate where the object actually is. For example, a church may be represented as a point on a map 
with a particular uh, symbols. Talking about lines, lines are objects which cover a given distance but are not concerned with areas. They can be a single straight line or length of lines made up of several linked sections. That's polyline. And an object such as a path or road could be represented as a line on a map. The line would indicate the position and length of the path, but would give no indication of the area of its surface. Lastly, polygons uh, are enclosed areas with a defined boundary marking the extent of the area covered by the feature. For example, a forest would usually be drawn on a map as an area of forest. So note that objects could be represented by more than one type of object. For example, um, a car park could be represented as a point showing its location or a polygon giving both its location and area covered. So often, the scale of the map would indicate the choice of objects uh, used. The raster uh, data model divides any given area into grid cells of equal size. The size of the, of the cell is referred to as the resolution of the raster and determines how many features can be displayed or described. Uh, raster data includes satellite or area imagery and gridded data sets. In any given, in, in any raster value, in any raster, a value is stored, is recorded for each grid cell describing its content. In satellite or imagery or area imagery, this value is simply a color value so that the screen can render it. For gridded data, however, the cell can or the cell value can be any type of continuous uh, data such as elevation, uh, temperature, uh, vaccination uh, coverage. GIS works by storing information about real-world objects and linking that information to the location of each object on a map. The data about each object are stored in a database, and it is common to store data about different objects or features in separate databases. For example, if you are collecting data on the location of vegetation types, but you are also collecting data on the number of pedestrians using a path, you would store the different data in different databases rather than mixing them all in one. Separating data not only aids viewing of the data, but it makes sense because different data sets contain different attributes. In a GIS, these different data sets are stored in different layers. These layers can all be opened and viewed in the GIS at the same time to produce a map that composes several different data sets. This composite is similar to drawing out each map layer on a piece of transparent film and stacking the films on top of each other. A specific analysis or map can be made by choosing specific thematic layers to include in your GIS. For example, roads, car parks, bridges, and railways can be used to create a transport network. All layers are standardized by a common coordinate system that helps each layer overlay perfectly on top of one another. Now we will discuss common GIS workflows and key principles. The overall GIS project workflow looks a little something like this flowchart. First, you acquire and import your data. But sometimes your data are a little messy and may contain the wrong spatial location or the wrong category, among other errors, so you have to assess their usability. Geoprocessing is the task of tidying and transforming your data so that any errors that may affect your analysis will be removed. Then you can analyze your data and create models to answer your scientific questions. At the end, you can present your interesting outputs and findings to communicate your results. As I mentioned previously, the first step is to acquire your data. Data can come from non-digital sources, such as paper maps or records. An integration of data from several different digital sources, such as spreadsheets or satellite imagery, or the collection and entry of completely new data. There are two stages of data acquisition. The primary stage involves collecting data in the field. Data collection may involve ground-based studies of topography, 
geology and vegetation, coastal surveys, airborne surveys using satellites and aeroplanes, or socioeconomic studies that involve interviews and transcripts of written documents. The secondary stage involves the conversion of these data into a useful GIS format, such as digitizing features from a paper map, deriving land cover classification polygons from remotely sensed satellite imagery, or plotting points from coordinates. Until the different data formats are transformed and standardized, they are effectively useless in a GIS, nor can they be analyzed or compared. GIS has the power to perform that integration. Before you can use any data, you must assess their quality. Information may be outdated, too large or too small for the analysis, in the wrong locations, or incomplete or irrelevant. Once you assess quality, you can edit and analyze the data as required to answer your questions. For example, you can query your data to acquire the most relevant information, such as if you want to find buildings above a certain size, or if you want to locate all the water bowl bore holes within a certain study area. Here is an example of a common geoprocessing tool. Clipping extracts a feature based on the extent of another feature. Here, you will see that the features in the left have been clipped to the extent of the orange area in the south of this region. Another common geoprocessing tool is buffering. You can see that the blue spatial features on the left now have a yellow buffer around them. And these can be used to estimate catchment areas of services such as health clinics. They can also be used to analyze whether or not there are enough health clinics in an area to service the surrounding population, or where new health clinics can be placed to service, to service the most amount of people. After analyzing your data, you can display and present the outputs in different ways. On the left is a population grid that was created using a model that incorporates census data, satellite locations, and other covariates. The map on the right shows locations where new schools can be placed based on buffers in a simulation. So these outputs are images on a computer screen, but they can also be printed out or placed in reports. Other data from these outputs can also be placed in spreadsheets for operational use, such as the, coordination, the coordinates of the locations where new schools can be built to scope out building sites. This section is going to cover how geographic information systems fit into the GRID3 approach. GIS is key to the GRID3 data solutions and the creation of the GRID3 geospatial datasets. This includes the creation of databases on settlement locations, which are vector point datasets, and the creation of settlement area databases, which are polygons. GIS is also used for the mapping of infrastructure and points of interest, such as roads or school data. GIS is also core to geospatial census modernization, where GIS technologies are implemented to increase efficiency um, of various stages of the census workflow. GIS, GIS is a foundation to the geospatial administrative boundaries datasets where it is used to conduct quality checks to ensure accuracy of the boundaries and to harmonize the data. Existing boundary data can often be incomplete or inaccurate, and GIS is used to assess the level of completeness and accuracy. As a final stage, GIS is also used to harmonize the boundaries with other data and national systems. GIS is also key to the modeling of gridded population estimates, where it is used to produce data inputs that feed directly into the modeling. GIS is a valuable tool for visualizing the output gridded population estimates and for analyzing and integrating the estimates with other sources of geospatial data. This section is now going to focus on applications of GIS, uh, specifically looking at GIS for census modernization in Ghana. Earlier in the year, Ghana Statistical Services, GSS, requested some technical support and training in geospatial data processing and analysis, which was in preparation for their census 
upcoming later on in the year. GSS were transitioning from manual procedures, uh, which focused around data capture and processing of geospatial data, uh, and they wanted to modernise these and move more towards digital geospatial alternatives to increase efficiency. In preparation for the census and upcoming enumeration, uh, an identified need from GSS was to look at assessing the difficulty of enumeration areas, which would help them estimate enumeration efforts um, and allow them to plan and prepare their activities. Grid 3 is working to increase the capacity of GSS to help them assess and validate enumeration areas to reduce the count of people missed by enumerators. Grid 3 have produced the hard to count indicators, which are a toolbox in ArcGIS. The hard to count indicators combine a variety of potential indicators that could influence the difficulty of moving or navigating around an enumeration area um, or an EA. The indicators are automated using Model Builder and Python, but are built as tools, so the user is exposed to a single tool interface. The outcome of the indicators is to produce maps that flag for each EA um, and each indicator whether there is a potential high or low difficulty. A difficulty score is calculated for each indicator and is combined into a single weighted value, uh, where areas of high difficulty are mapped in red and areas of low difficulty that don't require as much attention are mapped in green. There are a range of indicators that relate to the difficulty of enumeration. Um, and some of these indicators are included in the hard to count indicators toolbox, where they act as a potential guide into the difficulty. Variations in the difficulty of enumeration can vary depending on the location across the country. So it, it, it's important the results are always combined uh, with local knowledge from the field. The indicators are split into three categories. The first category is geometry, which relates to the size and shape of the EA. The first indicator in that category is the surface area of the EA, where a larger EA is going to take longer to enumerate. Uh, and the second indicator is the Polsby Popper score, which relates to the complexity of the shape of an EA, which can make navigating more difficult. The second category includes access accessibility indicators such as road density, so looking at how well connected an EA is, tree cover, which looks at how dense the tree cover and vegetation in an EA is, and finally friction surface, which looks at the difficulty or time taken to move around an EA. The final category in the indicators relate to building density and distribution. These include two indicators on the building count per EA, so looking at the number of structures that need to be visited in an EA, and the building cluster distance per EA, uh, which will be described in more detail in the coming slides. One of the key indicators is tree cover, which is important as dense tree cover can make navigating around an EA difficult and more time consuming. Raster data on tree cover derived from satellite imagery is used, which presents estimates of the percent of maximum tree canopy cover. The tree cover indicator takes this input data and produces the percentage of tree cover per EA, which gives an idea on how much tree coverage there is within an EA, um, which gives an indication into the difficulty of moving and navigating around that area. The building indicators are derived from Matsar building footprints, which provide polygon data sets of buildings across the country. Two indicators are, were built using this input data. The first is the building count per EA, where an EA with a higher number of buildings is going to be more time consuming um, as, there, as there, are, there are more buildings that the enumerator has to visit. Uh, and this would mean that that EA is marked as having a potential high difficulty. The second indicator is the building cluster distance per EA, which looks at the distance between defined clusters of buildings. 
This indicator calculates the straight line distance, so it doesn't include any roads or topographic data, but it provides an idea into the average distance needed to be travelled between clusters of buildings. This is an important indicator as an EA may have a lot of buildings, but they, might, they may be highly concentrated together, which is going to be easier to enumerate than an EA with fewer buildings that are more spread out, uh, where time needs to be taken to travel from one cluster of buildings to the next. Thank you for listening to this Grid 3 webinar on the principles and applications of geographic systems. If you would like to get in touch about anything shown in the webinar um, to find out more about the Grid3 program and our data solutions, you can reach us at info at grid3.org. Um, or to find out more about the work we're doing, you can find us on Twitter at Grid3Global or on our website at grid3.org. Thank you for listening.